welcome to another edition of Cincinnati Sessions, a production of the University of Cincinnati Internal Medicine and Residency. I'm your host, Eric Worm, and today we're going to cover Gilbert syndrome. First a case. This is a 25-year-old medical student who presents with jaundice. He had episodes of jaundice in high school and college, but it's been worse since he started a medical school. The most recent episode occurred after an early morning pharmacology test. He noted mild anorexia, anxiety, and abdominal pain the day of the test. His friends noted yellow eyes. He's sexually active with three partners. He has rare alcohol use now, but did binge drink in college. He has no history of injection drug use. His mother has type 1 diabetes, has a second cousin with autoimmune hepatitis, and his physical exam is normal except for mild scleral icterus. I share with you now the labs. The past eight years of liver chemistries are shown here, and he's had a normal complete blood count, blood smear, reticulocyte count, HIV, and viral hepatitis studies. Pause the video and take a couple seconds just to review the tests that you see here. So a question. Which of the following tests should the patient undergo? An ultrasound, a liver biopsy, autoimmune studies, genetic testing, or some other type of test that you might think? Pause the video and try to answer this question for yourself. If you're next to someone, present this case to them and discuss together. After you try to answer the question, resume the video. Gilbert syndrome was first described in 1901 by Augustin Nicholas Gilbert. It's also known as constitutional liver dysfunction, familial non-hemolytic jaundice, hyperbilirubinemia 1, Mullen-Grock's disease, and unconjugated benign bilirubinemia. And except for Mullen-Grock's disease, the other de descriptions really describe what is going on in Gilbert syndrome without using the eponym. One fun fact, Gilbert published a textbook with Jean-Alfred Fournier of Fournier's gangrene fame. Heme is released from senescent red blood cells and is oxidized by heme oxygenase to biliverdin, which is subsequently reduced to bilirubin by biliverdin reductase. Biliverdin reductase is found in all tissues under physiological conditions, but especially in reticuloendothelial macrophages of the kidney, spleen, liver, and brain. Bilirubin binds to albumin and then is transported to the liver where it is conjugated by UGT1A1 with UDP glucuronic acid to increase its solubility in water. Almost 100 years after its clinical description, Gilbert syndrome was linked to a genetic variant of the human bilirubin UDP glucuronosyl transferase gene, otherwise known as the UGT1A1 gene. These enzymes perform a chemical reaction called glucuronidation in which a compound called glucuronic acid is attached or conjugated to one of a number of different substances. The protein produced from the UGT1A1 gene is the only enzyme that glucuronidates bilirubin. Over 100 UGT1A1 variants have since been reported, leading to a continuous spectrum from mild hyperbilirubinemia on one end with Gilbert syndrome, all the way to life-threatening jaundice with kligler nager type 1 disease. Gilbert syndrome is characterized by mild, unconjugated, non-hemolytic hyperbilirubinemia, which does not lead to hepatic inflammation, fibrosis, chronic liver disease, or liver failure. Symptoms usually appear first during adolescence when alterations in sex steroid concentrations alter bilirubin metabolism, leading to increased plasma bilirubin concentrations. Some affected individuals have reported vague, unspecific symptoms, including fatigue, weakness, and GI symptoms, such as nausea, abdominal discomfort, and diarrhea, but researchers do not believe that these symptoms are related to excess bilirubin in the blood and just may occur coincidentally. With the exception of intermittent episodes of jaundice, most patients with Gilbert syndrome are asymptomatic and have normal physical exam findings. During an episode of jaundice, the examination will be notable for scleral icterus, but findings can be much more dramatic. Laboratory testing reveals unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia with total bilirubin levels that are usually less than 3 mg per deciliter, though in the setting of increased bilirubin production, the levels may be higher, but almost always less than 6 mg per deciliter. Precipitants of jaundice in Gilbert syndrome include illness, infection, dehydration, stress, exposure to cold, menstruation, overexertion, fasting, lack of sleep, and alcohol intake. Individuals with Gilbert syndrome may be more susceptible to the toxic effect of substances that require bilirubin UGT-mediated hepatic glucuronidation prior to excretion. Drugs that should be avoided if possible include Adazanavir and indinavir used to treat HIV infection, gemfibrozole for lowering cholesterol, statins also used for reducing cholesterol when taken with gemfibrozole, 
irinotecan used to treat advanced bowel cancer and enlotinib for the treatment of sub-blood cancers. A presumptive diagnosis can be made in patients with the following features. Unconjugated hyperbilirubinemia on repeated testing, a normal complete blood count, blood smear, and reticulocyte count, normal plasma aminotransferases and alkaline phosphatase concentrations, and the diagnosis is definitive in patients who continue to have normal laboratory studies other than the elevation in plasma bilirubin during the next 12 to 18 months. The diagnosis is supported by observing a rise in the plasma bilirubin concentration following a low lipid 400 kilocal diet. Another provocative test is to administer intravenous nicotinic acid, which causes hyperbilirubinemia within three hours, possibly because of an increase in bilirubin formation in the spleen enhanced by uptake of the liver. However, these provocative tests are seldom necessary in clinical practice. Genetic testing can confirm the diagnosis in settings where there is diagnostic confusion. It's only currently available in some clinical laboratories and generally not done. So coming back to our case, which of the following tests should the patient undergo? Ultrasound, liver biopsy, autoimmune studies, and genetic testing. The answer is once you know the full picture, no further testing is needed. And now some questions for reflection. Starting with heme, what is the process of formation of bilirubin? What are the typical levels of bilirubin seen in Gilbert syndrome? What are the three features associated with a presumptive diagnosis of Gilbert syndrome? Pause the video and try to answer these questions alone or with a friend. Try to say the answers out loud. If you have to, rewind the video to find the answers. Thank you for reviewing this Cincinnati session on Gilbert syndrome. Please look for other videos in this series on our website.